If you have your Bible, please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 19. We're going to try and summarize it so that we can pick a few things that will be important for us this morning. Let us pray before we read God's word. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful privilege to be found in you a privilege to be gathered together as your people, a privilege that you've granted to us to come and dive into your world, and we ask that you, you would pour out your spirit upon us and upon our church that will be effective in displaying the Christ-likeness in our daily lives. So help us, God, as we go through your word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we concluded with a short story of a man called Apollos, whom the Bible told us that he was um, an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures. And this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. But as he came to Ephesus to preach to people, he, be, he, he went to the synagogue and spoke boldly. But when this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, heard him, they took him aside and to further explain him accurately the way of the Lord. Because when he came, he had only uh, been taught about the uh, baptism of John the Baptist. Um, and that is what he, know, he knew, and he preached that hard. And he was introduced to the aspect that we saw Jesus, and Josh has been talking about it uh, with the Great Commission. Jesus said, go ye into the world, preaching the gospel, making disciples. And for those who believe, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so Aquila and Priscilla did that. And this man became even more uh, fires. The Bible says, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the script that, scripture that Jesus is the Christ. And that is the, 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 the central point of our, of our message, that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Today what we have here, beginning from verses 1, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper region, Ephesus, and found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as had whether there's a Holy Spirit. So he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hand upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, 
before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years so that all who dwell in Asia had the word of the Lord being taught, both the Jews and the Greeks. This is the first portion we're going to talk about. So we see um, Paul now going into the region of Ephesians. You remember a few weeks ago, uh, Paul wanted to come to this region, and the Holy Spirit forbade him twice not to go into this region. And you'd wonder, or you'd think about it this way, you know, well, the reason why maybe the Holy Spirit didn't want him to go is because maybe they don't need him. Maybe it would be dangerous. Maybe whatever the reason would be. So he was divided to go to um, Macedonia, and he preached at uh, Philippi and established a church there. That was the first time the gospel ever went to Europe. But the very place that the Holy Spirit forbade him to go, that is where he is right now, he's gone to. Which means, you know, when God tells you not to do something for a particular time and season, you ought to believe that it is good for that season. Seasons might change and the Lord would tell you, now you can go to this season. You know, maybe it's not a season for you to do a certain business. Maybe it's not a season for you to get into a relationship. You say, for now, just focus on me. And then when that season come, I will prompt you again for you to get into that season. So you better trust the leading of the Holy Spirit as Paul did. But when he get to this place in Ephesus, he found some disciples there. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I don't know the occurrence that caused Paul to ask them this question because normally he just goes to the um, synagogues, he preaches the gospel, others who believe, others who not believe, others would say, we'll hear you again in this matter. But here he found some disciples people who are instructed in the way of the Lord as formally as Apollos was instructed, but he didn't um, understood it to the extent where he taught about, you know, the infilling of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit did not come upon him yet. But all these things are so different and they work together. For we cannot box the Holy Spirit and say, hey, the, the, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and everybody there was filled uh, with the Holy Spirit and they spoke as the Lord gave them utterance. In some instances, uh, in Samaria, for example, when the gospel was preached and people believed you know what happened? Peter and John were sent to go there and affirm what happened. And when they had, they had gone there, they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now here we see that we have disciples, people who they have heard about John the Baptist and what he taught them about repentance. But they said for sure, we have not whether there is a Holy Spirit. Probably that's why Paul said, you guys need to be empowered fully. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Perhaps it would be what Paul wrote to the Galatians about the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Perhaps he didn't see that. For when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there's joy that comes with it. There's God's peace that comes with it. There is gentleness, self-control that comes with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And perhaps he looks at them and like, I understand what you have received. 
but you're not joyful. Gloomy faces. <laughs> there's no joy, there's no peace, all this stuff. And he says, you guys need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And say, for sure, indeed, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. But this is what he said. That you should believe on him who would come after me. That is Christ. That means these people, uh, they had not received the preaching or the in-depth explanation of Jesus Christ because he said to the disciples, go and wait for the promise of the Father. Maybe they had not received the promise of the Father yet upon their lives, but when Paul laid his hands upon them, they received, they were baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. What does that mean? You know, they, they spoke and prophesied. What language was that? We'll just go back to the beginning. When the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples who were praying, the Bible says that they spoke as the Spirit gave them what? Utterance as the Spirit enabled them. And everyone who was in Jerusalem wondered that they, these people are Galileans. How is it that they are speaking our own language? Though it was probably not known to them, but it was known to other people. And they heard the marvelous and wondrous things of God being spoken. Because God is not the source or the author of confusion. Does not confuse people in the church so that people will just begin speaking in tongues that are unknown. And if be there one who would speak in unknown tongue, there must be someone else who would interpret that tongue so that the church will know what the Spirit of God saith to the church. It is not just me blabbing, blabbing, and saying things, and at the end of the day, like, yeah, today the service was awesome. What happened? We spoke in new tongues. So what did you say to God? Man, you know, we, we don't need to understand. We don't, we don't got to know it. We just got to speak it. No, 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 no. I want to know what I say to God. <laughs> I want to know what I, it's a relationship. I want to know what I'm saying to God. And if at all there would be that gift of speaking in tongues, God will raise another person who will interpret what the Spirit is saying. So don't get them mixed up. In the former days, when the, uh, the Bible says, and the Spirit of God came upon an individual and they prophesied. He came upon them and they spoke the oracles of God as God gave them utterance. In the New Testament, we see now the accompaniment of their speaking in tongues as they proclaim the goodness of God, as they prophesy, proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah. That is the point. Jesus is the Messiah. For if you do not know him as Lord, actually we are going to see a group of people here who did not know God, but they thought they would use his name for whatever reason. So he laid his hand upon them and they received and they were baptized. And there were 12 in number. I don't know why that number is significant, but there were 12. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But some hardened their hearts and did not believe, but spoke evil of what? Of the way. You guys know what the way is? Basically, Christian, they spoke evil 
of the way. They had called them earlier on that these are the people of the way, the way of Jesus, the way of those who follow Jesus, the Christ-like people. And they were like, no, 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 we, we, we don't want to receive him. We don't want to. They refuted. They hardened their hearts, the Bible says. And Paul withdrew and he continued reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This guy was a professor, a very learned guy who had a school where, you know, students would come and learn about the law and a lot of things. So Paul consistently went there for little about two years and more, reasoning with people daily. And he continued for two years so that all who dwell in Asia had the word of the Lord Jesus, both the Jews and the Greeks. Remember, this is the region where the Holy Spirit told him, don't go there. Now this is the region where everyone now is hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ, both the Jews and the Greeks. So this first part that we just read, we see that we had a group of people who had somewhat believes, but not in fully. No, the gospel was not uh, explained to them in full. And that is the number one miracle that we see there, that the miracle of a spiritual healing or a spiritual awakening, that after they received the Lord Jesus, they believed and they continued to prophesy. The second part we are going to get into from verses um, 11 to 20 is going to talk about the miracle of uh, physical healing. Now God wrote or worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul so that even the handkerchief or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirit went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took took upon them themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? (laughs) Then the man in whom the the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. That is what you get when you use the name of Jesus without proper knowledge. Naked and wounded. Don't try it. The Lord Jesus here is using Paul. First of all, before we get to that part, most of the time when we hear, you know, the infilling of the Holy Spirit and different aspects You know, remember Jesus, you know, in the gospel, sometimes he told them to put mud on their eyes. Sometimes he told them he he touched their eyes. Sometimes he just sent word and they were healed. So it becomes a problem when us as a people, now we, we try to box God. You know, we are the mud in the eye only. (laughs) Just mud in the eye. Or we are, he touched my eye, religion only. Or we are, he sent his word and healed us. That is not how it works. We cannot box him and say, this is, this is the way he did things in the past. He's going to do it that way again. We cannot fix him. 
the way he has been, you know, coming into people, filling them with the Holy Spirit. These, they're, they're different. Some were filled right there. Some went their way, they, they, they received the gospel later on. Hands were laid upon them. They received the Holy Spirit. What you gonna do about it? You say, God, you're confusing us. Your ways are not straight. No, no, no. He knows better than you. God does not want us to fix ourselves in a particular box and say, this is the way he's going to come. And here, this next part, we see that God wrote or worked miracles. God uses human hands to do his work. The question is, are you an instrument that God can use? Many people, when God would use them in this like manner, we're going to open a ministry straight away, right? Miracles, signs, and wonders, that is what we will see in the banners. You know, bring your sick, bring this, bring this, bring this. We're going to publish it. But Paul Paul was not even concerned about a lot of these things. In fact, because the region of Ephesus this time, they say it was very hot, so they would have things like turbans on their head to cover them from the heat. And at times, he'd sweat and take it away and just put it aside as he's walking, preaching the gospel and making tents. And so these guys thought, maybe we don't, Paul cannot come to that place. He cannot go to that house We have heard maybe about Peter who just walked and his shadow was healing people. What about this cloth? He's talked about Jesus and there's a woman who said, only if I would touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. And they say, well, let's try it. There's no harm in trying. We're going to do it. They would take his, uh, his handkerchief and apron and go put it on people and they'll get healed. People with evil spirit, the evil spirit would leave and go. They're like, God, what are you trying to show us? In fact, the Bible, the, 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 the writer here say that God worked unusual miracles. These are not the usual miracles we used to. So when God is walking in unusual way, you don't take glory for it. You say, voila, <laughs> even my clothes. Have you seen people standing on the pulpit? And you're like, everybody, you're, you're sick. Come touch my shoes. <laughs> Come touch my trousa. <laughs> don't do that. I don't want to do that. Because... I don't know how God is going to touch your lives. I don't know how he wants to come and heal you. All I know is he can walk when you're driving at home, when you're walking at your shamba, when you're writing things. God can walk at any time. Come touch my shoes. No, they're dirty. Don't touch them. You'll get hedged by lorry. (laughs) But you look at what God is doing, unusual miracles. And these sons of Skiver, the enemy lied to them. <laughs> and they say, they come and they say, uh, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is amazing. You know, in regards to miracle, there's potential in believing God to do something now. Hebrews 11.1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's confusing, right? It is the evidence, but I can't see it, but I believe it. I know that God can work it out. I know that he's able to do it. I don't got to manufacture things or try to work it out. God knows how to work it out. 
there is a great blessing when you believe that God can do it right now. Right now. I don't know how he's going to do it. And that is not my job to tell you how he's going to do it. I only know that if you call upon him, he can do it. He's done it before. It's not going to be the first time. These sons of Scepha, they say, <laughs> uh, no, this, this evil spirit say, I know Jesus. I know Paul. But who are you? You know, also when it comes to the issues of miracle, there's no second-hand relationship that would work these miracles. There's no second-hand. It has to be first-hand. <laughs> it's either Jesus is doing it or whoever believes in Jesus that God is doing it through him. We do not have honorary members in the kingdom. <laughs> there's no honorary members. You can do things in the name of Jesus, but there's no relationship. It doesn't go anywhere. Jesus said, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will see the kingdom of God, except those who do the will of the Father. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know, but who are you? And that is actually where we draw our title for today. Whose name do you bear? Whose name do you bear? You just speak because you've heard it, or there's conviction in your life that for sure, this is my conviction that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord. And see how this evil spirit is speaking in a more personal way. I know Jesus. I know Paul. Who are you? <laughs> Would you really say that? That I know Jesus personally. I know Jesus. And so when you don't, you know, the, the enemy knows it when you're faking it. He's just laughing at you. Like, ah, your, your, yours is not real. It ain't real. For those that are real in Christ, even the enemy knows. But the difference is, this evil spirit or the enemy, he knows but he does not worship him as Lord. You know him, and you worship him as Lord and Savior. That makes the difference. It's not just saying, well, I've heard about Jesus, so what? Do you know him? You have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Or you think there's a, a honorary seat for members in the kingdom of God? No, no, no. It does not exist. It does not exist. So these people, they were naked and wounded by the enemy. This became known both to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and they totaled the 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed in Ephesus. The word of God prevailed mightily in Ephesus. Because they saw, they considered what God is doing, the miracles, the people receiving the word, and it grew so big. But also, I would want 
us to be drawn to this verse again. That those who were practicing what? Magic and sorcery and other things, which means this thing was actually published and they learned about it through books. They brought all these books. We have gasoline here. If you have those books at home, I want to help you. Bring them out, burn them for you. Those who have those books, you know them? You know, the, the, the likes of my best life now. You guys have them, right? I can see them on your faces. They are painted, the titles are on your faces. In fact, you have a bookmark in the middle of <laughs> some weird book. Please bring them. We have a chimney out there. We're going to burn them. These people, some of them are very prominent people who brought this book. But they brought them after the gospel reached their hearts. But you know the difference with us? We, we, we want to hear the gospel. We want to do what God says. But I want to hold on to these things. I don't want to let them be. Anything that depicts idol worship in your life and still is in your house, bring it before the Lord and we'll burn it. So burning books that are not godly is a righteous act. Okay. <laughs> it's very righteous. I'll help you burn it. That for me tells you know, a heart that is changed. That I'm not going to do this anymore. I've been doing it. I live it. I've been a part of it. I don't want to do this anymore. I have idols in my heart. I want to bring them before the Lord. I, I, I don't want it anymore. What kind of idol are you hiding in your house? And the word of God prevailed. And when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I had been there, I must also see Rome. Rome was the capital of uh, the Roman Empire, and he desired to go there. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time, there arose great commotion about the way, about what he was preaching about the Messiah. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit of the craftsmen. These people had a lot of money through this. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity in this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into dispute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worships. Now then, they heard this, and they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, um, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions, 
And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Paul thought, man, this, this theater would hold 20,000 people. He's like, 20,000 people are going to hear the gospel at one go. <laughs> and they're like, ah, I don't know, chill out, relax. Then some of the officials of Asia, who are with his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not even, he, he, he will not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried, one thing and another, one thing. For the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. This is the, the, the tragedy of the crowds. You find people shouting in the street and you get yourself shouting and you're like, so, what is happening? You're, sh you're just shouting, oh, he, he, Diana, Diana, what's up with Diana? Is she married? What's up with people just guessing the crowd? They don't know what is happening? Fanatics. They don't know what is happening. They just want to shout. And, you know, some of them would come shouting. They don't know what is happening. And, you know, sometimes they have picky, picky, ponky. <laughs> that is what they are coming to do. You know, they are shouting, but they're getting into your pockets, stealing. They didn't know why they came together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jew putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, this is a very uh, intelligent guy, he said, man of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know what the city of Ephesians is? In the temple of the guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have case against anyone. The courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charge against one another. But you, if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. In other words, this gathering of yours is unlawful. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. There being no reason we should give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. You guys go home. There's nothing here to discuss. I love this guy too. <laughs> and part of, you know, what he's doing, this city club, that when any uproar would happen in any city that is part of the Roman Empire, they were in danger of that city status to be taken away of them. So they thought, man, if, if it is known what is happening here and it's not lawful, we're going to lose our city status like we just received a city status the other day, and all of a sudden you go in the El Tred town. <laughs> you go back to the former. We, you don't like it, you, you're kind of getting used to it. And you're like, man, that status is taken away. We don't want it. And this guy cleverly sent the people away because there was no cause of alarm. The only thing that Demetrius was worried about was his money. He wasn't go. 
or to, to, to earn a lot of millions of money because of the fallen business. He's not going to make, you know, these silver shrines of Diana selling to people, selling to people. You know, a lot of people have these things in their houses. It might not be of Diana, but you have something in your bedroom, you're hanging on there. You know, when, when you want to say a few things, you're like, blah, 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 blah. Let me go and consult this. <laughs> Those things are evil. And this is happening in Ephesians. You know, Ephesians, Ephesus was a very important city. There's a warning that is given in the book of Revelation about this specific church. Remember, they received the gospel. They, you know, the word is going throughout Asia and, you, you know, there's uproar and also there's God's word growing day after day. But you see, when that is happening, there's always a looming danger that people will get so much excited and forget about the important things. Are you going to hold fast? The Bible says here in Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. as the worship team comes. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? This thing says, he who holds the seven stars in the right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tasted those who say they are apostles and they're not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not come become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That was a very stern warning from our Lord Jesus Christ. He knows the end of things before and he warns us don't go to the way of the idolat uh, idolatry, serving other gods, putting things in your house, you know, taking God's glory for granted or taking God's glory for yourself, that God has used you. God has wrought miracles through your hands. You're taking it upon yourself and say, hey, you, you guys have seen what God has done through my hands? puffing yourself up and thinking that you're the greatest of all time. You're, you're not even the sheep, you're the goat. They call themselves the goat. I don't want to be the goat. I'm a sheep. Me <laughs> mini kondo. Remember, Jesus is speaking to this church. He said, nevertheless, I have this one thing against you. That would be sad to hear that amongst the many things you have done, you have served the Lord, you've been, uh, you have resisted the false teachers, you have denounced them, you have done so many things. And he says, but I have something against you that you have forsaken the most important things. You no longer love me. You have mastered these words. You can speak them to people, no problem. But you don't love me. 
you're not kind to people the way you used to. You don't serve the Lord the way you used to. You don't give to the Lord the way you used to. You don't visit people the way you used to. What happened? Where is the zeal? Where have you gone to? You've remained like the sons of Sceva who would say that I bring to you this Jesus whom Paul speaks, yet there's no relationship. The Lord is calling on all of us. Say, I know your deeds. I know the things you have done. They are in my records. But I got something against you. That will be something that should take us to our knees and pray to God. When we think they're hidden, no, they're not hidden. Do you know that in this region, though it's never called Ephesus today, do you know that there's no church that exists where this church existed at that time? telling us that if you don't repent, he says, I will take the lampstand away. I will take that fire away. I will take my presence away from you. You might remain and people would think, oh, you're magnificent, or oh, you're wonderful, you're this and that. But nonetheless, if we don't Remember, repent, and rebuild a relationship. We're going to be wiped away. And these are not my words. And as we bow our heads in prayer, I want you to take time and think about those things that you have neglected, those things that you have left and the Lord is calling you and say hey would you consider this would you consider maybe you're here and you're saying I want you to join me in prayer Maybe I have gone into the way of the Nicolaitans. Maybe I've gone the way of just doing my own things. I have neglected the Lord. I have a form of godliness, but God's power is not with me. Whatever the case, If you want prayer, you're welcome here. We'll pray with you. I'm going to give you a few minutes. If you want to come, we'll pray with you. There is a very special thing that happens when you believe God for now. That God can redeem me even now. That can change. God can change that situation today, now. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for. These men and women who were practicing exorcism, they brought all their books before this man of God, saying, I don't want that anymore. I want Jesus. I, want, I don't want this lifestyle anymore. All I want is Jesus. If that is you, just walk straight here in the pulpit. We'll pray with you. There is no shame in coming to Jesus. He knows your heart better than anybody else, better than you. And I'll bring all the pastors, if you're here, please join us here.
The Lord wants to redeem you. The Lord wants to work it out for you. The Lord wants you to have a relationship with Him. The prayer team and the pastors, you're welcome to pray for this, dear one. The rest of us, you can bow your head and just pray in your heart. I don't know what it is that the Lord is reminding you to do. Maybe you have forsaken your first love. Your relationship has become so casual with the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is calling on you. He wants to help you. He wants to redeem you. To my child, I know you. He knows it ahead of time. That is why he warns us. If you don't consider, if you don't repent, I'm going to take my presence away. there will still wait on you we want to pray with you we want God to redeem you we want God to begin a new walk in your life freshness God, we thank you. We thank you for your overwhelming love. We thank you that you would also remind us of your word. We thank you that you're mindful of us, that you you don't want us to perish in our old nature, granting us opportunities to come before you. What a joy to know that your spirit is calling unto us. Thank you for those who have come before your presence, before the witnesses, expressing their need for you, O God. I pray that you bless them. I pray that you bless their obedience to you. I pray that whatever it is that, Lord, you begin a new work in their lives. What a great testimony that would come out of their lives for their obedience to your word. And we thank you. We bless you, Lord. And as we serve you and worship you with our offerings, we also pray that you bless the the, the works of our hands that will continue to be effective in the service of your kingdom. Blessed time in your presence also in Jesus' name. Amen.